Um, thank you, Kate, so much. And uh, it's great to, to be here. And you can hear me OK at the back. Brilliant. So we've got an hour together now um, at, the, at the beginning of the conference. And as Kate said, what I want to talk about is, is leading change into the future. And um, I work for a little team. Here we go. Uh, inside of NHS England, it's called the, it's called the Horizons team. And, uh, and there's about 15 of us. And, um, and basically what we do is we connect up with um, other people around the globe who are uh, uh, interested in where change is going, what's happening with change, um, uh, futurism. So we link up with um, academic colleagues, with, with practitioners. And, uh, and it's such a big part of what we do is to you know, um, take um, ideas and practices and principles and uh, bring them back to, uh, to health and care and uh, understand the extent to which you know, we, can, um, we can use them to make our own change and improvement practice uh, better, faster and more effective. And, you know, if you actually take the people in our team and you were to, to kind of um, put their, um, their experience end to end, it's probably about a, a hundred years or more of, um, of experience in the, um, in the health and care system. And, you know, like for me personally, as somebody who spent um, a, a whole career running big, systematic improvement programmes, um, the, the older and wiser I get, the, the more radical I get. And, um, and that's why, actually, when we go back to the... Um, the first slide, uh, the title slide, uh, when we talk about leading change into the future, I've actually chosen an image of a, of a social movement because um, uh, I think you know, uh, movement ideas are, um, uh, you know, I think, are highly pertinent to where we're going. So what I want to do first was to, to talk about uh, big trends in the world of change that are starting to have and will continue to have a massive impact on our world of health and care, um, but also the world of, um, of education and, uh, and research. And, you know, um, whoever we talk to in the world, in whatever sector or industry or health and care system, people talk about the same trends. So what I would like to do to start with is, to, um, is for us to explore um, four of the um, biggest trends. So um, the first one, we know this. Like when we look globally, what we see happening is that change is becoming uh, faster, bigger, more disruptive, you know, on a wider scale. And, um, you know, as somebody who is a, um, a kind of passionate advocate of quality improvement, you know, I, will, I would never, ever criticise um, or, or undermine the role of small scale incremental change. It's critical. But on its own, it, it isn't enough. You know, um, the world's going to a different place. And... Um, you know, um, you know, we can look at this and we can laugh, you know, um, instead of risking anything new, let's play it safe by continuing our slow decline into obsolescence. But the reality is, if you look at the health and care system in this country, actually, most of the ways that we go about improving performance or, uh, or, or trying to manage improvement, actually, the methods haven't changed for 25 years or, or 30 years. And yet, you know, um, the, the way that, that um, in the wider world um, change is happening is, is changing massively. So, I mean, here's just one example. This comes from IBM. So, you know, um, big organisations like IBM have ditched large two, three, four year change programmes. Okay? Because in this very fast moving world, you know, you can put two or three years of massive effort and huge resource into a change programme and then you get to the end of it and guess what? It's obsolete you know, because the world's moved on. So even with very, um, very large, complex uh, uh, change transformation improvement processes, more and more we're moving into 30, 60, 90 day um, change cycles. So when we're actually training our future um, health and care professionals, uh, you know, to be the change leaders of the future, I think that the kind of design methodologies that are about, you know, rapid uh, uh, tests of change is where we need to be going. Um, the next big theme that we see across the world, I'm calling here the acceleration of, um, of connectedness. But, you know, the extent to which um, every one of us can connect with virtually um, anybody else anywhere in the world, you know, uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day with very little effort or, um, or, or resource. 
And so, you know, what it means is that um, our connections have gone from being a very small, tight number of connections to massive um, connections. And our ability to, um, you know, to, to, uh, to find knowledge has just has, has, uh, has, has changed so much. And, you know, when you think about this, when we used to think about connections, um, you know, um, they were very close and tight. But now, uh, you know, we're connecting um, all over the place. And I think that um, this... You know, this, this world of digital connectivity gives us um, uh, all sorts of interesting insights. So here's one of them. Um, this comes from um, a, a Dutch organisation, Innovisor, and what they've been doing is using advanced social analytics inside organisations. And what they're finding is that typically about 3% of the people in an organisation um, will, will drive conversations with 90% of the other people. So if we're trying to make change happen in a big system, instead of like starting at the top, or maybe as well as, and you know, trying to push change down through a hierarchy, instead, let's actually find our 3% and, uh, and work with them and, uh, and enable it to happen. And um, you know, how we think about sharing knowledge is changing so much. And you know, when I think back to the last 20 years, you know, I've spent the last 20 years as a uh, national level improvement agent in the NHS. And I've spent an awful lot of my time uh, writing improvement toolkits. You know, we go around the system. So we're trying to, if we're trying to improve stroke care or we're trying to improve, um, you know, support for people with um, dementia or end of life care. You know, what do we do? We go around the system. Uh, we we, um, we uh, around the world. You know, we find the evidence of what works and we put it in a toolkit. And guess what? Toolkits don't work very well. You know, um, actually, the reality is that if we create situations where people can connect and people can have conversations, it's um, uh, according to Nick Milton, who's kind of one of the um, uh, leading kind of thinkers and practitioners around knowledge management, actually enabling people to connect and have conversations is 14 times more effective than giving people um, quality standards or best practice databases or, or toolkits. Okay. Um, the third thing we see across the globe, across multiple organisations, and even in health and care, and even in the academic world, is that hierarchical power is diminishing. Okay? Note the word, diminishing, not diminished. Um, uh, we'll come back to that. Um, so, you know, if we look at this, this is an organisation chart from the Tabulation Machine Co. Uh, and it was, this was written in 1917, so exactly 100 years ago. <laughs> And if you look at most health and care organisations, if you look at most universities, okay, um, they still look like that. And, you know, um, that, that kind of uh, way of organising was, was perfectly designed for a world that was, that was stable, that was predictable, where change was small scale and incremental. You know, it made absolute sense to organise people into, into um, little silos uh, to control the work. Um, but... You know, in our in our current era, it just doesn't work any well as well. And you know, um, what the, the kind of evidence tells us around uh, around hierarchy on its own, okay, as a mechanism for for driving change, the first thing uh, we know is it's it's pretty slow getting things down through systems. And secondly, um, hierarchies tend to be incredibly risk averse. And often, when we're trying to do radical, fast, large-scale transformational change, um, you know, it, it um, we don't need risk aversion. Okay, we need courage. And uh, again, this is back to our friends at um, Innovisor. And you know what they're saying is, if you think about you know, the classic organisation chart that we see in health and care organisations, um, that, um, that we see in academic institutions, okay, it's you know, designed around certain ways of working. And actually, our, the real organisation you know, um, will look very, very different to that because people are connecting in so many different ways. And what Innovisor said is, if you look at organisations, in, in 2005, what you typically found was just one person in ten working in a department or a, or a silo in a hierarchy. Just one person in ten was, in, was regularly connecting with people in other departments and other silos in a systematic way. You get to 2015 and it's nine out of ten people. Okay? So... so um, uh, it's interesting because, because uh, kind of lots of people I connect with are anti-hierarchy. I'm not anti-hierarchy. Actually, I can't think of a single organisation that I know that hasn't got some sort of hierarchy. Okay? However, on its own, um, hierarchy, and I think in our current era, um, won't deliver change um, fast enough, um, quickly enough, and we need some other things. 
And um, uh, this is interesting, you know, um, very often now we're, we're in an era, particularly in, in, in health and care, where, where it's about collaboration, it's about integration, you know, it's about not just changing organisations, but whole systems. And, you know, since we've had in health and care the era of sustainability and transformation plans, which is about, you know, not just um, improving at the level of an individual organisation, but a ho across a whole geographical system, you know, it, it's got to be about, um, it's got to be about trust, it's got to be about collaboration, it's got to be um, about relationships. And, uh, and actually, if we want people to connect you know, uh, um, cross organisationally, cross system, you know, across whole places, then um, we need to work out how we can do it. And in a sense, we can't do it um, by, by pushing it down through silos. It isn't going to work. Actually, we need, to we need to find the people in the system that are the, the connectors, you know, people like the 3% and, um, and, um, and link them up with one another because we'll actually, um, we'll actually get better results. Okay. The fourth big theme that we see globally is that... Um, change is moving to the edge. Okay, what do we mean by that? Well, if you look at R and D, uh, big pharma, what what we see is that um, innovation R and D functions that used to be right in the middle of the organisation have moved out to the edge. Okay, and again, it's because of these these other factors that if actually we want to compete, we want to stay ahead in a very fast moving world, um, we can't do that from the centre of an organisation. We have to, in a sense, step to the edge of the organisation. So one foot inside the organisation, one foot outside the organisation. And actually by being on the edge um, in that way, what it enables us to do is to connect up with a far uh, you know, greater range of people, um, different ideas, and bring those ideas in. Um, I'm going to show you one organisation now that gets this. And um, what I want to say about this before I show you is that if this organisation gets it, then um, there's kind of hope for us all, and uh, and uh, you know maybe we should think about it too. So uh, this is from the cabinet office, okay? Whitehall, central government, and um, and what what um, the, uh, the cabinet office has done is to is kind of understand that when it comes to policy innovation, you know that um, it, it ain't a great idea to do policy innovation from the middle of the cabinet office in Whitehall. So, so what they've done is they've shifted their policy innovation function to what they're calling a policy lab. And again, um, you know, uh, in this era, you're hearing all this kind of la design language, you know, calling things um, um, laboratories and, and sprints. And, um, you know, uh, there's, there's a whole kind of new lingo around it. But, you know, essentially what's happening here is, you know, the, the, um, the policy innovation function has gone to the edge, right on the outside, so that those, those, those people that are leading on innovation are connecting up with, uh, you know, with many, many different people, different ideas, and then they're bringing the ideas back in. So if you like, in an old world, the, um, the innovation function was right in the middle and, or at the top, and we'd push it down. In this world, it's on the edge, and we pull it in. And just, just finally on this, I just want to show you and my favourite quote about being on the edge, and this comes from Islet Barron, and she says, you know, why, do we, why should we be leading from the edge? Why should we be focusing on the edge? And she says, leading from the edge brings us into contact with a far wider range of relationships, and in turn, this increases our potential for diversity. Now, in this, um, in this world of rapid change, connectedness, diminished hierarchy, and the edge, um, this word diversity comes up time and time and time again. And, you know, often um, uh, those of us in health and care, when, uh, often when we talk about diversity, we mean it in the context of, um, you know, uh, of inclusion and diversity, which is a very important thing. So what we mean by that is, you know, how can we um, uh, have a workforce that, that truly represents the people that we serve? How can we make sure that all the people in our organisation, uh, you know, um, have a voice? Okay. And, in a sense, this form of diversity or this thinking about diversity, it includes that and it's wider than that. It's about, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, decision making, uh, uh, designing, how can we have diversity of, of thought, different people's experiences, diversity of background? And I think the evidence on this is, is pretty clear because time and time again, studies have shown that if we get a diverse group of people, bring them together, they will consistently make better decisions than small groups of so-called experts. Okay? So, so in a sense, this is the era um, of diversity. 
in that sense. And it leads to more disruptive thinking, um, faster change and, um, and uh, better outcomes. You know what, what I thought was great, actually, when I looked at the programme for today and I look at the oral presentations that are coming after me and the coffee break, they're so in the spirit of this. Um, and um, uh, yeah, more of that later. So I think, you know, at the, at the heart of this agenda and the changes that we're seeing um, is the issue of power. And uh, so I chose a definition from the father of modern, modern logic, uh, Bertrand Russell, and he said, power is one's ability to achieve goals. So in a sense, you know, if we want to make things happen, um, uh, where's the power? And in a sense, when you think about those four dimensions, what we can see is power is shifting massively. What I'm going to do now, I just want to show you a framework about power, and then I'm going to stop, and um, uh, then you can have a conversation with the person next to you about it, Okay, what you think. So, um, this, is, this comes from um, a book that is going to be published in 2008, and it's going to be the leadership publishing phenomenon of 2018. And it's by Jeremy Hymans and Henry Timms, and, and, uh, and it's, about, it's about new power. Okay? And what they basically say is that where we are now in the world, there is this constant fight going on between old power and new power. And we absolutely see that currently in the health and care system. So let's just, I'll talk about it a bit and then, then, then um, let you talk about it. So let's start off by talking about old power. You know? um, old power is like a currency, it's like money. Uh, some people have got a lot, but most of us haven't. And you know, it's about positional uh, uh, authority. And the thing about old power is that it gets pushed down in the organisation, it gets commanded. So again, in our world of health and care, you know, you've got to do that because it's a four hour target. Okay? You've got to do that because it's the performance agreement. You know, you've got to do that because it's in the commissioning specification. You've got to do that because it's the performance agreement. And old power tends to be closed. So if I'm the, if I'm the, the chief exec of a, a community uh, health trust and, I'm, uh, and my organisation is working with local lead, leaders of the local community, you know, I can't command them to do anything. So in a sense, it, it goes to the edge of my organisation and it's closed. And old power is largely transactional. It's about systems and processes and governance mechanisms and holding people to account. Let's contrast that with new power. New power is like a, a current, an energy that, that happens when many people come together with the, the same values and the same goals. And basically, the more people that engage, the more powerful we are. It's made by many. So, you know, we can pull it into organisations and systems. It's, it's shared. You know, anybody that agrees with our, with, our, with our goals, the things that unite us can be part of it. And it's, it's open, um, new power is open to, um, to anybody. And the thing about new power is that it's largely about relationships. You know, one of the differences between old power and new power is that people that engage in new power will engage in it because they want to, not because they have to. Okay? Uh, but when I give my time willingly, um, I have to trust that the things that people say will happen as a result will happen, because I won't give my time willingly again. Okay, so it's very, very relationally based. Now, um, lots of people that I connect with around the world, like futurists, are forecasting the death of old power. Okay, I don't think old power will be dying in any health and care organisation or university um, that I know anytime soon. Um, however, uh, it, is, it is very, very strong. And you know, in the current very, very difficult situation that we find ourselves in, in the health and care system, you know, there's such a sense of a kind of, you know, um, the renaissance of old power. And you hear people being told, you know, leaders being told, you know, you've got to get a grip, you've got to get a management grip, or, you know, you've got to, you've got to sort those risks out. Very, very old power, okay? But what we're seeing increasingly is a layer of new power coming uh, on the top that I think creates all kinds of relation uh, opportunities. And I'd also say where, where we need to be as leaders in this world, okay, um, uh, all of us, whether we're frontline change leaders or we're, um, you know, we're formal leaders in the system, is to actually be able to operate in that very, very difficult zigzaggy place in the middle. Because, you know, when I look across the NHS, for instance, and I see the, the formal leaders, the chief execs that I admire the most, Actually, what I see about all of them is that they're the people that not only have got the old power authority, but they work in new power relational ways. 
So I'm just going to stop there for a couple of minutes. So why don't you say hello to the person next to you or the person behind you? Okay. What's happening about old and new power in your world? on if that's okay. Should we, um, should we move on? Um, just to say, I, uh, should we move on? I, uh, I, I love the energy in the room, it's fantastic. Um, just to say by the way that um, all these slides are going to be available afterwards and you're welcome to have them and uh, do whatever you want with them. So let's carry on. Okay, on the same theme, um, this is uh, some of the uh, research that's influenced me quite a lot as a practitioner in the health and care system. So um, this was a, a study that was carried out by two Canadian researchers, Batalana and Caschiaro. And what they did, they went into a very big organisational system and they followed 68 change projects around this big system. Because what they wanted to understand is what are the characteristics or, or the, the, the situational circumstances of people that are actually able to make change happen in big complex organisations? Okay. Does anybody know what, the what is the name of the big organisational system that these two Canadian researchers went round? Anybody know? Okay, it was the British National Health Service. Okay. <laughs> okay, so they followed 68 projects around the NHS. It's a really interesting study, uh, but the one point I wanted to make from it was what they actually found was that actually being an effective change agent, a great change agent, was very little to do with old power and where you sat in the hierarchy. Okay? Being an effective change agent was much more about where am I in the informal network. And basically the people that were at the core of the informal network were actually uh, much more able to make change happen than the people at the top of the hierarchy. And you know, a lot of the people that, um, that we work with in the Horizons team, you know, we work with a lot of students and clinical trainees and frontline colleagues. And, they, and you know, people say things like, you know, well, you know, I can't make change happen in my system because I'm only a trainee or I'm only a student or I'm only a nurse. And the reality is, you know, all of us, um, all of us can make a difference. And I'll show you some more on that. So it's worth thinking, you know, when we think about our current um, agenda uh, for, for radical large scale change in health and care, you know, who are the people that are going to make the change happen? And again, this is, um, th this is kind of um, the wording I'm using here is for a particular organisation and, and, you know, um, you have your own version of this. But, you know, who are the people that are actually going to make the change happen? Is it people in list A, you know, that are transformation delivery board and um, the, um, the senior leaders, the chief execs that are the, the sponsors because it won't work without a sponsor and um, the PMO, the program management office, you know, the, um, the 17 work streams of the, uh, the delivery board. OK, the, uh, the formal clinical leads because you can't make change happen without clinical leadership. OK, um, where it's multi-organisation, you know, the directors of the participating organisations all need to be involved. Um, or is it the people with the formal roles, like, you know, the quality improvement advisors, the organisation development leads, the people who are, who are formal change facilitators in the, in the organisation and do that as a job? Or um, is it list B? You know, um, the, the mavericks, um, you know, the rebels, the people that are challenging the system, you know, the positive deviants who are just doing things in a completely different way to everybody else and they're succeeding. Okay, the non-conformists who are looking at the world with a different pair of glasses on. And um, the hyper-connected, do you know, when you're leading big change, hyper-connected people, they can either be like your biggest asset or your worst enemy because um, the fact they're hyper-connected means they can get other people to do stuff. So, so like when they're on your side and like they're, you know, they're championing what you're doing, having hyper-connected people is marvellous because, you know, they make all these things happen. They spread behaviours, they role model at a scale, they set mountains on fire, they build energy, you know, and so on and so on. Okay. Um, um, when, um, uh, when hyper-connected people don't agree with what you're trying to do, it, it can make life very difficult. And I think the same with people that are hyper-trusted by others as well. And, you know, it's interesting. So um, I'm working with a number of the um, sustainability and transformation programmes, uh, you know, um, uh, across England. And actually, um, you know, when you look at what they're doing, which list do you think most of the SDPs concentrate on? Yeah. 
and you know this is our reality you know that actually the people that live and perform in formal organizational land and the people that have actually got the power to make or break change are two different groups of people and you know we really really need to be working with both and there's loads of evidence that backs this up i picked one which was david Dun um, dinwoody and you know if we start at the um, at the top left hand corner there you know, if you look at, at some of the evidence around large scale change and why it fails, I mean, you know, the different people have got different theories and the reasons are many and complex. But one of the things that we see consistently is actually, you know, when we look down the line at, at whether change objectives were achieved or not um, and they're not achieved, it's rarely because, you know, we didn't bring McKinsey in to do fantastic analysis or we didn't structure that we didn't do the diagnostic properly or we didn't we didn't structure the plan okay it isn't usually for those kind of reasons it's much more likely to be about the list b people you know it's it, um you know we fail because we we fail to take account of the informal networks in the organizations and systems affected by the change so you know in our current era of change in the nhs and the wider health and care system actually if we're going to make transformational change happen we've got to connect with those wider group of people you know the people that want to you know the people that that want to be part of the change um want to connect in a um in a new power way and um, um this is a guy i love his work he's a guy called um, mark jabbin and uh, he's a uh, emergency physician from florida and he's like obsessed, I think that's the only way I can put it, with um, the neuroscience of resistance to change. And, uh, and it's kind of really clever stuff. Um, but, you know, this is one of the things I pulled out from what he says. He says, you know, when you think about, um, you know, how do, we, um, how do we properly engage people in change? How do we, in, in inverted commas, stop people resisting uh, change? What he says, this is what we shouldn't do, but what we do do. So... Um, what we do do is we identify um, an issue, you know, um, so, um, you know, uh, uh, you know um, massive variations in um, around patient safety. OK, um, and uh, um, we have a small group and we come up with a desired outcome, you know, the improvements that we want to make uh, to make it safer for our patients. And then we come up, we say, well, you know, um, this is our problem. We've diagnosed our problem. Uh, what are our options in terms of what we're going to do about it? So we, we look at different options. We then make a choice around the action that we're going to take around patient safety. And at that point, we start engaging people and we try and get people to buy into um, the, the solution that we've come up with, with, with really good intention. And he says, uh, that isn't what we should do. And this is what we should do. That actually, as soon as we've identified um, the issue, we need to start engaging the people that are impacted that, by that issue in the widest possible sense, you know, as early as possible. So that when we start to think about what's our desired outcome here, actually right from the start, we make it a shared outcome. And when it comes to creating options and, and choosing what to do, we're actually doing that um, collectively, collaboratively. And he says, you know, often in the health and care system, we talk about getting buy in to change. You know, how are we going to, you know, can we, how do we get doctors to buy in to change us? Yeah. So um, people are always talking about that, you know. How do we get doctors to buy into quality improvement? OK, wrong question. OK, because actually we don't need buyers who buy in. If we want people to buy in, it's too late. Actually, we need investors. You know, we need to be involving people um, uh, much earlier. And... Um, you know, um, I'm, a, um, I'm a social scientist by, um, by training and uh, actually I'm one of the few people I know that uses what they learn in their first degree every single day in their job. And, um, and actually, you know, at the heart of social science, one of the big dilemmas is, is the dilemma between um, structure and agency. OK, and, uh, you know, when it comes to actually changing the world, which matters the most? And... If you think, you know, you, we, when we look at, um, at public service, okay, and the public sector, you know, much wider than health and care, and public sector reform, you know, the big, big focus over recent years has been around structure, okay, how we change the structure, so we have, you know, around performance goals and targets, around increasing regulation, uh, compliance, uh, competition, quality assurance, um, you know, uh, positional power, um, uh, bringing in formal improvement programs and program management systems, incentive systems, um, you know, uh, sh trying to shift um, organisational cultures. Okay, um, so you know, those are all kind of structural um, 
uh, responses okay, to big problems. Uh, and I think you know, we, can, um, we can look at the opportunities around agency. You know, about how do we um, build people's ability to make choices? How do we activate people? How do we activate patients, you know, to manage their own health? How do we um, activate change agents in our systems? How do we build people's capacity and capability? How do we build self-efficacy? And so by self-efficacy, we mean the extent to which I believe that um, I can actually make the change happen. You know, how do we build collective power, distributed leadership, social movements, solidarity, social action, and so on. And you know what I'd say? I'd say um, our world is changing. And if we look globally at, at, um, at public sector reform and interventions, what we're seeing is we're seeing a big shift happening, okay? From um, a focus on structure to much, much more focus on agency. And you know, one of the ways I describe this, um, so um, agency, you know, the capacity of individuals um, to make their own choices and, um, and to take to take action so in a sense people giving people power in a given environment and then you know words that we talk about that are linked to agency action activity effect influence power choice and you know we get it so um so um <coughs> this is a little um cartoon that was drawn uh, for my team and um, a couple of years ago we did a learning review across the nhs and what was interesting about this was the most um um you know uh, dominant um comment that we got was frontline colleagues, doctors, nurses, uh, trainees and um, support workers, allied health professionals saying, um, I would like to improve lots of things in terms of um, the, the, the area that I work with day to day, but I haven't got permission. And this kind of sense of a permission culture was absolutely pervasive. Okay, everywhere we went, frontline colleagues talked about, um, you know, um, needing permission and a permission culture. So let's think about that in the context of structure and agency. You know? Is the issue here a structural issue? I.e., there's an issue in the, um, in the wider environment um, for, for, for change and all the structural mechanisms that we've, um, that we've put in place okay, are, are creating this problem. Or is it a question of agency? You know, the extent to which I, as a doctor or nurse or a trainee, um, you know, haven't got the confidence or the, or the skills um, uh, you know, to, uh, to make change happen. Because you see, if it's an issue of structure and the issue is a permission culture, you know, how long does it take to change a permission culture? You know, 10 years, 15 years, okay? Might be waiting forever. But, you know, the great thing is, if it's an issue of agency, okay, we can build agency, okay? And we can do it much more quickly. And obviously it's a complex situation and it's a combination of both. But I think actually by focusing on agency, we can make some big differences. And, you know, when we think about agency, we think about um, <coughs> in agency at an individual level and in agency at a collective level. So when we look across the globe in the health and care system and the transformation efforts that are going on at the moment, so much of that is about patients and building their individual agency. Okay? So how can we get people to take more power for themselves and more control um, so it's, it's you know, um, patient activation, patient activation measures, you know, shared decision making, self-care. We're very, very focused on, um, on individual agency, okay? which is a great thing. But the problem with individual agency is to what extent does it actually shift power? Because what you've got is all over the place, lots of individual isolated patients, um, you know, um, uh, focusing on their own power. So we need to think as well about collective agency. And collective agency happens when people come together with a common cause, um, you know, build new power, um, you know, uh, um, harnessing the power and influence of a bigger group of people with a common cause and building mutual trust. There's that trust, there's that trust word again. And you know, what I'd say is, um, I think that the big, big opportunities that we have Okay, Indivi of course individual agency is important, is around building collective agency, you know? We do not become transformed alone. We become transformed when we're in relationship with other people. And you can just see this happening in so many ways. I mean, one of the ways um, are these things here called um, MUDOCs, which are massive online open disease um, orientated communities. And all over the globe, you know, people with um, particular um, uh, uh, 
health issues or um, you know particular diseases they're not waiting for the medical profession to come along and say you can do this you can do that they're getting together with um, with other patients or, or other people um, uh, you know with, um, with 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 similar needs and experiences and they're getting organized so you know across the globe for instance we've now we, we know of at least 60,000 online diabetes communities and at least 80 million online patient communities and you see things like, you know, patients like me or Inspire, where, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are able to connect with each other, you know, virtually with, um, with common health conditions. And it's making a real difference to, uh, to research. I picked a couple there, the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project and Cancer Tag um, uh, uh, Ontology. And, uh, you know, what's happening was if you were, for instance, a researcher, uh, on metastatic breast cancer and you wanted to work actively with, uh, with patients, you know, you'd have to go through, um, through many, many steps of the system. So, uh, you know, you'd have to link in with the university, with the, um, you know, with the hospital, and uh, eventually you'd connect with the patients, okay? In a world where people are hyper-connected, projects like the metastatic breast cancer project means that researchers and groups of patients are just, just getting together like that and are really pushing forward and accelerating um, the level of knowledge, um, the rate of research around uh, metastatic um, uh, uh, breast cancer. And the other thing I'd say about that, you know, there's a lot of evidence as well that shows us is that when people get together collectively, okay, when you're ill, you know, even when you're really ill and you're, you're, you're taking a lot from the system, actually being part of community and giving to others is really important to people, you know, so it works on lots of different levels. And we're seeing this kind of coming through in, um, in, in many of the, um, the big trends. So one of the trends that we're seeing here is this idea of new public passion. So, you know, in a sense, when you think about, you know, the way in which since the, um, the late 1990s across the globe, you know, um, public sector, we've had this approach, uh, which is called new public management. Okay? And new public management is about holding people to account. It's about transparency. It's about performance goals. It's about reducing variation, holding to account. Okay? And, and there's a kind of sense of moving from the era of new public management to new public passion. And this idea of how do we link with you know, the intrinsic motivation with the agency um, of, um, of public officials. And this one comes from Singapore, this one comes from New Zealand, this one comes from the UK. Um, really interesting work going on at the University of Birmingham by Catherine Needham and colleagues around the 21st century public servant. And you know, one of the things that she talks about is about joy at work. You know, and should we actually write in um, the, the role of a facilitator of joy in the job description of public servants? And, um, and this, um, this one here comes from the BMJ, the quadruple aim. So if you look at the, the um, uh, transformation programme for the health and care system at the moment, the five-year forward view, it's based on a model which is called the triple aim. And what the triple aim says is in our transformation efforts, we want to make, we want to, our first aim is to improve the, the uh, experiences and outcomes of individual patients. Uh, the second part of the triple aim is to improve the health of the population. And the third part of the triple aim is to make best use of resources and reduce costs. Okay, that's the triple aim. And more and more now, this came from the BMJ, what we're, people are saying is that we need, a we need a quadruple aim. We need a fourth aim, which is about actually creating meaning at work. Okay, for, um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, connecting in with what really matters, focusing on the well-being of our workforce. Okay, so, um, and I think, you know, it's all part of the same thing. And um, in terms of um, my little team, Horizons, the thing that we get asked for the most is, um, is bringing um, social movement thinking into, into practice and delivery. So at the moment, we're, bringing, we're, we're, um, we're supporting a programme called Action on um, A&E, Accident and Emergency, and, um, and we're running it on social movement principles. Um, uh, you know, um, this one here was called the right prescription. This was using social movement and community organising principles across the country to um, to, to uh, reduce the unwarranted use of antipsychotic drugs um, with people um, living with dementia. So, you know, um, uh, more and more in um, in that context. So, um, I might just stop there for a moment. Okay, what's happening? Have a little chat with the person next to you. What's happening in your world about um, about agency, collective agency? Um, uh, individual agency, have, a, have an agency conversation.
Uh, yes, I'm, How, where to, uh, to, and I'll do a couple more. I'll do about another ten minutes, and then we'll have some questions. Is that all right? Okay, so that's okay. So, yeah, that's, that's fabulous. But they're so having good, wonderful tweets. Oh, that's on. great. Yeah. yeah. And am I pitching it about right? Yeah. It's it, this, it, it's great because there's been so many comments around. This is healthcare, but what about you know education? What about our duty for healthcare workforce development? Yeah. 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 Great. Right. And it's stuff that you really kind of get. Oh, it's just kind of sparking a rebellious streak, hopefully, in people. Yeah, good, 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 good. good. Yeah, it's a few more people coming in now. It's difficult, isn't it? Kind of, uh, yeah. Judging, judging, yeah. But I think it's just good in that. I mean, the conflict, there's a lot of energy. It's hard to put, stop people talking to each other. So, hello. Hello, hello. hello. how are you? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, lolly dollies. Pardon? Lolly yeah. dollies. Yeah. <laughs> so we've only seen one at the moment. We thought there was going to be two. Uh, the gentleman here from IT's got one just in case as well. So it's registered stuff in if needed it. So we've come to. So Helen said about. But there's a tenant then, then we'll. And then we'll probably come out. So it was a good opportunity to come to the front and then we can yeah. prepare. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. 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 if that's okay. Should we, um, should we all come back together? Okay, let's come back together. So, um, the final topic I just wanted to talk about is, um, is the era of the platform. And again, I was interested that one of the um, oral presentations um, after the coffee break is about platforms. It's about ELP, ELPs, which is electronic learning platforms. But it is exactly the same. Um, who's doing that? Who's doing electronic learning platforms? Oh, yeah, fantastic. OK. <laughs> but I'm just saying we're on the same wavelength. Yeah, so it's good. OK, so, um, so you know, um, this is the era of the, of the platform. Um, and I like this quote here from John Hagel, you know, he says, um, um, actually, platforms today power learning and innovation at the speed of change by providing like spaces, you know, where um, where people can um, can connect that are collaborative and sometimes exponentially productive spaces for people to create value. And, and I talk about change platforms and you talk about learning platforms, but it's exactly, you know, it's exactly the same principle around how do we create that space where people come together to, to learn, um, to, uh, to collaborate and to, uh, and to grow. And, you know, what we're seeing uh, across the globe is this big shift that's happening. So I took this, this, is, uh, this only got published about three weeks ago. Um, PwC, PricewaterhouseCooper, every year they do an innovation benchmarking survey, and this is the recent one. And what this is showing is, um, in terms of how are, how are you know, um, big forward-thinking organisations across the globe going about um, uh, how they create innovation. And um, a lot of the ways that we did it traditionally, like you know, traditional R&D, um, uh, innovating to ex emerging markets and exporting it out, um, taking risks and trying again, internal incubators and so on, okay, are, um, are we're using those methods much less. And the methods that we're using more is about open innovation, you know, new power, um, open, you know, um, um, anybody that um, can contribute does, okay, um, you know, design thinking, um, co-creating with our customers, partners, suppliers, and in our world that would be, you know, with our patients, with our, with our students, um, and, and so on. So, you know, it's really where the world's going. 
And, um, and what we're also seeing um, is, um, is a sense of in organisations and systems, more and more we need to be moving to, um, to um, what these authors call adaptive spaces. Okay? Um, because you know, what we've got here at the top is the, kind of, um, is the classic um, uh, operational system. And you know, in, in, um, in 1917, with the Tabulating Machine Company, um, that operating system uh, would have been enough you know, to develop change. But the speed that we're going at now, what we've got here is we've got the kind of innovators in our organisations doing really interesting and, um, and uh, radical things and a disconnect between the, op the, you know, the formal operational system and the innovators here. So in a sense, what we've got to be able to do is that we've got to create, be able to create adaptive spaces where people can come together and, um, and, and learn and share. And these adaptive spaces, um, uh, they, are, um, they are change platforms, they're, uh, they're, they're hackathons, they're unconferences, they're, they're, they're just places where people can come and, uh, and share and connect. <coughs> And, and so, you know, what we're seeing certainly in my world of change and innovation is a shift from change programmes to change platforms. Okay, what do we mean by that? Okay, see, I haven't got a problem with like change management, not really. And um, the problem I have with it is the way that people do it. Because, you know, too often senior leaders in our system, they don't just prescribe, you know, this is the outcome that we want from our change programme. They prescribe this is the micro step by step way you've got to do it. So for people at the front line of care, for patients, it feels very imposed. It feels, you know, um, you have to do this rather than connecting with me and my energy and what I want to do. So what we're seeing more and more is the, is the setting up of change platforms, these adaptive spaces, okay, which create a space, a place where everyone, you know, um, and we shouldn't have to put service users and families, but um, uh, we do, can help tackle the most challenging issues. And here's that diversity word again, you know, valuing diversity of thought. You see, in, a, in the, um, the formal world of change management, you know, if, if people in the system don't like the change, then we put all sorts of horrible labels on them, like we call them resistors or laggards or in denial. Because, you know, in this world of change management, you know, this is our, this is our goal, this is our programme plan, and this is the way we're going, and these are all the timescales and the boxes that we've got to tick on the way. And anybody that gets in the way of that is a problem, okay? In, in this world, um, you know, the world of change platforms, we flip that. Actually, what we're saying is we want that diversity, we want these, these, um, these different perspectives, and we're creating this space where people can, um, can learn, they can share ideas. And actually, the role of formal leaders in a world of change platforms is much more difficult. Because in a world of change programmes, you know, you can say, well, I, I know you don't agree with the four-hour wait, and I don't agree either, but it's the government, you know? Um, whereas um, in this world, you know, it's about relationships, it's about trust, it's about connection, it's about following through. And I just want to show you one of them, um, um, last thing I want to do, I just want to show you one of our change platforms. So um, this was some work that my team did with the Health Service Journal and the Nursing Times, and it was called the Change Challenge. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to find out um, from um, our frontline colleagues across the NHS, okay, how we could be doing change better. And, uh, and what they did, 14,000 people contributed voluntarily to our, um, to our change platform because they wanted to. It was amazing, the response that we got. And, um, and what our crowd okay, of, um, of 14,000 people did was that they collectively identified 10 barriers to change and 11 building blocks for change. And don't worry, I'm not going to sit and go through these till half past 11. Um, uh, I think, you know, like none of us kind of would be surprised at the things that our colleagues said um, were the biggest barriers to change. But the thing that surprised me was the number one on that list. The thing that most people um, um, uh, said was important was the issue of confusing strategies. So what we do is that we come up with a new strategy. So um, uh, what's our latest one? Well, when we, you know, when we, got, we need to um, avoid winter pressures in hospitals and we need to um, get people discharged more quickly. So we're going to have a new strategy called criteria-led discharge, which means that nurses and allied health professionals can discharge patients when they meet criteria instead of having to wait for the consultant. Right? What a great idea. So then we, we, we lob it over the parapet and said you've, to all our frontline colleagues, these are the criteria, you've now got to do criteria-based discharge. So the people at the frontline don't know whether like, 
criteria-based discharge replaces what they had to do before if it's a higher priority, if it's the same as something else, if they've got to deprioritize something else to do it. Like, nobody tells you, you know? So, so um, and, and again, a lot of the work that we do around with social movement thinking is around narrative and framing, you know? How do we put the strategy and the initiative across in a way that's meaningful to people, that fits with their values, that makes them want to do it, and doesn't create confusion, you know? And I thought this was quite interesting, because at the same time, about the same time we were doing this, Gallup produced this, um, this global survey on why do change efforts fail. And, w and they found the same thing, but they probably paid about um, you know, £5 million for this. And, um, and our frontline staff told them the same thing. But anyway, what they found, the biggest issue was frontline teams getting inundated with messages from leaders that this thing is a high priority, making it really difficult for them to, to know what to focus on. So if you're the leader at the top, you've got 10 priorities, it's really clear. But you get to the front line, there's 40 plus priorities, what do you do? And I just thought it was so fascinating that our crowd, you know, came up with the same thing. So let's look finally at the 11 building blocks for change. And um, again, I'm not going to go um, through these. I think, you know, lots of them are, um, are obvious things, but we should be really paying attention um, uh, to these things. And again, there's something else it re this reminded me of. So um, does anybody know about Project Aristotle? Okay. Project Aristotle was, uh, was published about 18 months ago and, um, and it was published by Google. And Project Aristotle was the biggest project that had um, ever been under research project that had ever been undertaken into, in a single organization about team performance. And it was about what makes a really high performing team. Okay. And um, you know, really high performing, creative, effective team. And, uh, and what they found was the most important factor was what they call psychological safety. The, it actually, it's the extent to which people are nice to each other. You know, it's the extent to which people feel part of a team that is the, where people trust each other, where they trust their leaders. Because, um, because back, actually, if people feel psychologically safe, they'll innovate, they'll, they'll, do, you know, they'll do lots of different things. Um, and it's interesting, because actually, if you look at that list... Is exactly the same things as what people are saying you know the most important things are the factors that um, build psychological safety and again going back to Google you know what they found was um, it w actually the extent to which teams and leaders create psychological safety where people feel safe to try new things was far more important than having like recruiting the best most talented people Okay. Actually, talent, you know, um, psychological safety created, created more highly performing teams than, than talented individuals. So, I put some ideas down around um, the, the, the kinds of things to think about, because um, I thought I should, um, I should summarise. So, um, but I want to allow a few minutes for questions. So, you know, um, what are some of these ideas? First of all, how can we, like, frame our ideas in ways that will, um, that will really kind of connect and, and, uh, and, and capture what people want? You know, in a sense of um, being able to do that in a, in a, in a, in a new power way, OK? How, you know, taking steps to be social leaders, actually investing in our digital skills. You know, um, uh, so few change agents in the NHS are digitally confident. And yet, you know, it's just so where we need to go. You know, social connections, and we need to be leading through networks as well as um, uh, formal leadership systems. We need to be aligning structure and agency because we need both. You know, we need to find the people on our B list and give them really important jobs to do. Um, we, need to, um, we need to make space, you know, for, um, for collective sense making and, you know, building change platforms, building spaces, adaptive spaces where people can come together and, and learn and share and grow. Um, we need to be harnessing the, important, the uh, power of advanced analytics uh, because, you know, some of those analytics are showing us such important ways forward with change. And in terms of how we go about making change happen, you know, um, I think more and more, um, just in this very complex world, we need to be adopting emergent approaches to planning and design, you know, monitoring our progress, learning as we go and, um, and, and adapting in, um, in 30, 60, 90 day um, change cycles. And finally, you know, um, I think this is where the world's going. Um, you know, um, I think the last era of management was about how much performance we could extract from people. And I think those kind of approaches will take us so far. But in terms of the gap between like, where we are and where we want to be, I think actually um, the next era is, um, is going to be about how much humanity we can inspire. And actually, even though things are really, really difficult, um, I, I feel very optimistic. The end. <laughs>